Hey guys, so I want to start an episode of programming in Lisp. Um, Lisp goes way back to MIT and it's a pretty old programming language, but it's not what I would call an outdated programming language because it's not, there's actually a book. Um, I want you guys to look this up sometime. It's called Land of Lisp. Um, it's written by Conrad Barsky. I actually had the, the paperback hard um, version of the book, but here's a PDF right here. Conrad Barsky, medical doctor. Um, yeah, he wrote this book. It's actually really kind of funny. There's a lot of, like, here's basically what I was talking about, um, about Lisp not being outdated. So you had machine languages, you had Z3, I guess, and assembly, ARC, you had autocode and things like that in the 50s. Um, I guess you didn't have Lisp until the 60s. So Lambda Calculate, it's funny because they mention it here, but it actually, Lambda Calculus was invented in like the 1930s as like a, as like a, it came before the Turing machine, I think, um, by uh, Alonzo Church. So I would consider him the, the father of computer science. So anyway, I suggest buying this book. Um, Lisp here are uh, mice. Fortran's this, you know, dinosaur. You got this, you know, COBOL and things like that. And then you have the AI winter in the 90s and you have the 2000s. So in the 90s you had, I guess not a lot of different things. I'm not, I'm not really sure. But in the 2000s you had pointer arithmetic, Java, Ruby, Python, all this stuff. And like the Lisp guys are scared, you know. So after C Sharp and all this stuff comes along, you know, C++, Lisp guys become this creepy, you know, creature that's out of the way. And notice on his computer it says plus one, two in parentheses, and then you have three. That's because in Lisp, to tell it to evaluate something, you put parentheses, and then you put, you know, your function, and then you pass your function your arguments. So in this case, you have a plus, which takes two arguments, which are integers one and two and it gives you three now the syntax isn't the thing that makes makes lisp good okay it has nothing to do with you know parentheses or how it looks it that to me has nothing to do with what lisp is for in fact it was designed for ai um it's not really used for ai much anymore because it's i guess considered like slow but it is a good like language in the sense of what a language, a clean language would be. Like you wouldn't want to create a creature with like you know, you know the wrong number of legs and it's very imbalanced. But you know, it just so happens to run really fast. So you think it's a good design when it's actually a, a crappy design. But if you've never seen, you know, a horse with four legs or whatever, like, you might think that it's a good design. So, you know, people really, I would say they haven't seen Lisp. They don't understand, if they don't understand what it is, they haven't really seen it. Like, they might see the syntax of it, but they don't see the language for what it really is. Um, and it's not about, it's really not about Lisp, it's about math and... Lisp just has a few properties that make it clean in a, in a certain kind of way. It doesn't mean that it's by itself the perfect uh, end-all solution that contains all your answers to everything. I would, I would, I like to point towards calculus of inductive constructions, you know, for for that. But it is based off like lambda calculus as a as a mathematical system which is an underlying computation system. It really is. So um, assembly code and C kind of base themselves vaguely off of the Turing model, but not, you know, that cleanly. So just like Lisp doesn't necessarily cleanly place itself 
on the lambda calculus model. Um, it does assume that you write a file and then you use a file. So I don't like files. I'm against files. Um, call me crazy, but I think in the future we won't use files. And I don't think we should because I think files are trash compared to what you compare when, when you don't need them. And in, in basically, um, and by don't need them, I literally mean like you strictly every possible thing you could ever imagine a file doing. You you can do strictly better um, without them is basically what I mean. I don't mean it's my opinion. I mean like literally you wouldn't need them um, in a very strong sense. So this is kind of what the syntax looks like for common lisp. Um, I want to make an AI. Let's do it for fun. Mm. Okay. So how this is going to work is I want to make basically a, a Lisp program that takes a program. So we'll call it Lisp, po Lisp code and then it gives back Lisp code that's equivalent to it. Okay, but it's faster. So it's equivalent in value. Um, but it's faster. So result, result, right? It's going to, well, I don't know how I'm explaining this. But anyway, we give it some Lisp code, and it's got a certain length, like size, memory usage, uh, and time. Okay, and then this one has less of those three things, or one of those three things, or something like that. So for example, like I could write uh, an Ackerman function that gives me the result of Ackerman function. Now it will take really long to compute things bigger and bigger, but if I save some values, it'll use more memory, but it'll be much, much faster in time. So we might have to find a way to kind of, you know, balance the, those things. But if you can kind of I would say memory probably doesn't matter too much. Um, we could wait it and maybe make like a function that waits the thing so that you could say like every second counts as like, you know, 100 megabytes or something. And then for size, um, your code size could be less than, it could be very, you could just say that you don't require it to be that small maybe a kilobyte counts as a point or something like that because a kilobyte's worth of code is actually a lot of code um, especially if you don't have to worry about tiny little characters and things like that and you're just talking about like a parse tree you could fit that in just a few but you could fit a very insanely complex program um, with within one kilobyte um, a ridiculously Probably, well, I don't know about one kilobyte, but depending on how you're storing the bytes, it doesn't take a lot um, to get a lot of information. So how do we do this? Well, I want to take the base language Lisp and kind of just take the basics of it and then take like the basics the basic functionality, like the fact that you can make a function, the fact that you can make a a result or something like that, um, and, and use it, at, and, and use inputs and outputs. Um, and basically judge a function on how good it is at doing this. So even the result might not be precisely the same, but if it's like close, then it basically can earn 
itself value um, and, and kind of reproduce in a way and kind of be, you know, partake in a genetic algorithm basically. In fact, the genetic algorithm itself, the code that runs the genetic algorithm itself could be judged on how well it performs by a higher gen genetic algorithm, which basically its job is to make better and better genetic algorithm functions for doing that specific task. So, um, could you use this to, you know, make AI that play games and things like that? I would say theoretically, pretty much any AI type you know, idea you could ever think of probably would work at some scale. It's just what's an efficient way to do it within R. Like, I might come up with some ideas that totally make sense, but it might only be practical in a lot of cases if you have, like, you know, 10,000 terabytes and 200 supercomputers to work with or something crazy like that. So it's, you know, the scale efficiency is kind of where things get really hard, I think. You can come up with crazy, you know, silly generalizing ideas all day about, you know, how you're going to run through thousands of possible programs and things like that. Um, but I think the hard part comes in when you want it to actually be practical and with the, the resources that you have and on top of that um, you at least have to make it you know non-exponential or something um, so yeah this is my computer the background's been changing because I set it to change because I got bored of it always being this. It's always been this. So, um, so I got C Lisp here, which C Lisp, Lisp stands for Common Lisp. This is its man page. I am so bad at reading man pages. I like never would do it my whole life. I don't know why. Um, I guess I used to use the Q Basic and you know. I used to read those, um, the instructions on how to code in like QBasic when I was younger. But I mean, if you if you see this, it says AI.MIT. So this common Lisp Lisp comes from you know the artificial intelligence studies at MIT. So it's a United States university thing, and it's considered uh, under the field of artificial intelligence, which is kind of it's kind of that I find it kind of ironically hilarious because it's been like almost rejected in a sense as an artificial intelligence language not in the sense that people say that it can't be it's just in the sense that people really stop just using it for that at all um but I don't think that we sh we should I think we we should try to use it and try to mess around and have fun with it. Um, and not necessarily just Lisp, but things that are Lisp-like or, or have the good um, uh, aspects of Lisp, not the bad ones. So maybe a more heavily typed language, but the fact that it's abstract I mean, the fact that you can run eval is a bad slash good thing. It it doesn't retain its mathematical properties when you call eval. But at the same time, the fact that you can do that in the first place um, without having to run through, like, you know, something called a compiler and things like that is, is actually a good thing compared to the other types of languages that were around at the time that it was invented so eval is it's kind of this weird thing relatively speaking it was an awesome thing but absolutely speaking it's a horrible thing um, it's 
kind of like Minecraft. Minecraft's code absolutely sucked. It was absolutely terrible, but it was also the best code out there for doing what it was doing. So it's kind of a weird thing. I, I tend to judge things based on absolute and relative, and I find a lot of things being the best, but also sucking compared to what it could be, so. Um, let's see here. What can we do? Okay, so let's, let's, let, let's, lest, lest. If I say lest, that just means let's, right? Um, so if I do C lisp like that, okay, now I'm here. Now if I do, I think if I just do like plus five, five, yep, we get 10. There you go. Uh, if we do like times seven, seven, we get 49, right? Yep. Okay. And then if we do plus five, five, I think like apostrophe or something. Okay, see how that's not evaluated? Okay, so now if I do eval... Okay, I think I'm aborted out of it. I'm not good with the, how the, uh, what is it called? The, the REPL how it works um, so I'm gonna try something really quick I'm gonna do eval and then I'm gonna put it in parentheses like this yeah okay so so you can pass code so if you just called eval 10 I bet it wouldn't right if I didn't put the apostrophe here for example Oh, okay. That's weird. Okay, so I guess eval either just returns whatever is there, but if what's whatever's there is code, then it'll evaluate the code. Which makes sense. So what it's doing, so there's this thing called so code tends to evaluate anyway, right? But there's this thing called heating and cooling, which I'm not going to get too deep into, but it basically controls what gets evaluated first, the parameter or the function. You might think, well, why does it matter? You can evaluate the function, you can evaluate the parameter, and then you can, or the argument you'd call it, and then you'd pass the, the argument to the function and evaluate that, right? Well, no, not necessarily, because sometimes you can actually pass a non-evaluated argument into a function and then what the function can do is it can actually change it so for example like this code right here you might think like this is somehow equivalent to the number 10 but actually it's not because what I could do is I could pass this into a special function which looks at it and it basically says no 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 don't evaluate it break it apart and then change the second number or change the function to times Right? It could change this plus to a times. And then suddenly you have 5 times 5 is 25. So if you were to pass 7 and 3, sure, that would also evaluate to 10. But if you pass it into this thing that changes the plus to times, now you get instead of 5 times 5, you have 7 times 3, which is 21, which is different. So the code is different, even though its evaluated result is the same. And so you might not want to evaluate something. Um, Practical applications for this would be anything whatsoever which needs to look at code, which is what, which is the golden, you know, what we want. Um, if we can't look at code, then it's not, in my opinion, it's not interesting. My opinion, my favorite thing in computer science is is recursion and code looking at code and, 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 and things like that so um, yeah 
By the way, if you guys are wondering, I have Grab, which basically just takes snapshots. Uh, QuickTime, I use it to record like my screen and things like that. I haven't used Skype for probably maybe years. I haven't used TeamSpeak for years. I use Discord now. I use Google Chrome. I haven't used Gyazo. That was like Grab, but what it would do is it would actually, instead of saving <laughs> as a file, you would take a snapshot of, of something and then it would actually save it to a website. And then I have an audio um setup thing which i use basically i set up my audio so that i can he i can record my voice and like a like a computer game at the same time so oh and by the way thanks for thanks to this russian guy um on may 10th he basically or maybe that was when i messaged him but he became my first and only um, patron. So I have one patron, and that's him. And that's it. I don't have any more patrons. So please become a supporter. So let's go back to Lisp. So we have eval, right? Um, now we have read. And read, I suppose... what read does okay let's try this again let's try this okay cool so read is the input the standard input so when you run uh, when you evaluate this what it will do is it'll actually wait um, until there is actually standard input. So if there's not standard input, this will sit here and not evaluate anything. Um, the results are printed to the standard output. So that means you can also print things. You don't just have to evaluate a function. See right, right here it printed 11 but that's only because it finished evaluating everything and then just about it just printed what the result was but the thing is it could actually print things before it finishes evaluating you get what i'm saying so like, you can actually have like you can actually say like print blah 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 so seven and see how it says 12 twice that's because it printed it, and then it printed the ultimate result. Because I guess even when you print 12, print of 12 still returns another 12. So, um. so if I made some kind of loop, which I forgot how to do loops in, um, in Lisp. I guess I have them in that book. Um, and then there's nil. So an, so I'm gonna explain to you guys what in what a REPL is, which is this right here. This is read, evaluate, print, and then loop. And it's basically like this loop that keeps going and it actually is lisp running itself but what it does is it actually waits on you to enter in some text which it reads and then it parses as lisp and tries to evaluate it and then return the result to you print it and then it goes back and loops again so it's actually what's running here is already a lisp program running and the Lisp itself, believe it or not, is actually calling eval from the Lisp language on this te like on this text or on this input, which is crazy to think about. It's just kind of funny to think about it that way, but that's what's, that's what's like going on, which is really cool because the, the code to write this thing, 
this evaluator is actually not a lot of code uh, once you assume that you have the Lisp language itself available to you. So it's kind of like built into the language. Um, so, oh, my leg, whew. Oh, 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 I got this weird, like, I don't know what you call it, but like a cardio cardiovascular issue. Where like my arteries or something stop working. Oh shoot. I feel like my whole leg is about to just die. <laughs> Seriously. It's just crazy. I don't know what's wrong with me, but funny because I'm doing framing as a job right now so I don't know how I can move around so much if my uh, blood can't go to my leg some water juice or whatever that is Okay guys, my leg is hurting too much. Um, I'll pause this for now and yeah, bye. I'm back, uh, let's call this part two. So I've been thinking and it's the next morning and I thought a little bit about it this morning for a couple minutes and I, I figured how am I gonna, you know, figure out a subset of the language and actually I, f I decided on something which was to um, take the Ackerman function okay that's how you spell it but then make a loop incrementing okay so looping, incrementing, ap Ackerman, uh, I should just say an Ackerman lesk list. So if I can make a loop that essentially just goes through and outputs, um, Ackerman numbers, then basically I can take that information because that contains basically the Ackerman can contains the logic that I'll need in order to kind of generate sequences and lists and things like that something to allow me to compare algorithms to each other so I don't necessarily need some primitive types like floating points and things like that as long as it is a computationally interesting algorithm and Ackerman is probably good for that because um, it's not primitive recursive so it kind of tests your language to see if it can kind of just do I think general computations although I'm not sure if that's a f formally I'm not sure if that's a formal statement. I'm not sure if it's actually proof that your language is computationally complete. But if I take that and then I use the output um, and 
list it, then I'll have a kind of a subset language that I can use to compare. So I'll have something that maybe I'll be printing the digits of pi or something like that. But at least I can compare uh, lists, not just you know a single function. That's not necessarily you know turn complete or something. Um, but because it because Lisp is recursive, I'm pretty sure it would be. Um, so yeah. Think about this for a second. So then I could have another function that basically just goes through them and kind of simulates them for, I don't know, five seconds each or something like that, or maybe less, maybe a few milliseconds each. And it just gets some output. But what it does is it compares outputs. So if it sees a new output, um, one that it hasn't seen before, then it's unique. And so then I can put it in a, in a list um, and look just look at everything that's produced. Kind of like brute forcing through all Turing machines and, and seeing what kind of pictures they produce and things like that. The ones that use like pixels as memory. Uh, but in this case, I'm brute forcing through some, uh, some Lisp-like programs and looking at essentially uh, the outputs uh, that they produce and comparing those. One problem I'm thinking of is that I won't be able to output I might it might be trying to output like actual Lisp code which I don't want so I don't want it to you know use an apostrophe or whatever you call it for a Lisp expression, thinking that, you know, it's going to reduce to a number or something and output the number. I'd rather output numbers and not have to worry about um, outputting Lisp code on accident, uh, because that's harder to compare, I guess. I don't want to compare strings. So... Yeah, I'll have to look up an Ackerman function and I'll get back with you guys when I do that. The goal was to eventually have a system where we could generate um, Lisp expressions and compare their results, but also be able to time them out. Um, so timeouts are necessary. Um, I want to start off with something very easy and basic. So it's, it doesn't involve lambda expressions or anything like that. It's basically just uh, recursively generating uh, numbers um, that are being added and multiplied. So we start with only zeros and ones because when you, when you start with just zeros and ones, you can get anything else by just adding. So you can add ones to get twos, threes, fours, whatever you want. Obviously, you can multiply them too, um, but you don't even need to do that to be able to get the all the base numbers. But if you start with zeros and ones, you can get everything um, that you want out of the natural numbers. And of course, from the natural numbers, you can pretty much do any computable uh, thing from there. But um, I've been messing around with this, and I have my book here, handy dandy book. And so numbers in Lisp are different. So if you try to do something to an expression, for example, 
this for code is not a number, so you can't pass it into a plus. So even though Lisp uses X, S expressions, um, it doesn't mean you can just like add a number to an, ex, an expression. So a number is more of a primitive. Um, so I'm going to try to get this working, and we'll get back to that. See you guys in a second. I mentioned to you guys what's driving me nuts about Lisp here and what I think is limiting it. Um, so I've been trying to figure out how to map two lists with each other um, and I was able to get something working. So if you see this right here, I can map um, addition to different numbers as the second number. So I figured, okay, well, to map uh, the first number, um, I can, you know, nest that. The problem is, is that apparently you cannot nest commas. Now, syntactically at the top level, apparently it accepts it. It thinks that you can nest commas. However, what it gives you back is apparently not a comma. See, I have a comma for the N. And apparently that was just considered some kind of macro. So I need to figure out like an actual function which retains the nesting so that it's not considered a macro, I guess. I, I guess it's parsing it before you know it evaluates. It doesn't treat this comma as a local um, symbol of some sort. It's, it's just treating it like... I'm not sure, but somehow it treats the list properly, I suppose, because when you when you use this, it it um, treats it like it's a list. So I'm not really sure how to do an inverse list um, in such a way that Lisp understands it. But I'm starting to think that however they coded Lisp, it's limited because of that. So. We'll stop here and I'll let you guys know if I make any progress. Okay, guys, this is awesome. Um, I'm so glad. Some of my favorite times in my life is, is when I'm when I'm thinking something that I hope is not the, the way it actually is, and then I find out that it isn't. And <laughs> so, if that makes any sense, I like um, finding out that I'm wrong when I think something that I'm possibly write about is a very bad thing and I think what I just figured out was that Lisp actually does work the way that I was hoping that I really was hoping that it actually did and that is um, I think it does allow you to essentially propagate commas but it does but it kind of rewrites things in a different syntax when it does that um, and I didn't realize that's, I think that's what it was trying to do or was successfully doing. And maybe, I'm not sure if my code was wrong, I'll have to double check to see why the outer expression wasn't working. But I did test an eval of that smaller expression and it, and it actually does work. Um, so when it uses this list command, um, that's a different way. Writing this expression right here is exactly the same as writing this expression. So there's no commas um, in this one. Instead, they use a command called list, and then they back quote everything in the list except for the thing that you're basically unback quoting. So instead of it propagating commas um, one level deeper. I guess it'll process the, the information, um, I guess capitalize everything, which I'm not sure if that's going to cause it an issue, but then it, um, it uses list instead of comma. Now why this doesn't work, I'm not sure. I'll have to figure out why. It does evaluate to something. Um, but there's kind of this weird issue of there, the 0 and the 1 not being back quoted, which is kind of strange. 
Um, so the N is not back quoted, and then the M, which I double back quoted, kind of weird. Um, if I single back quote it, it doesn't, it, it, it ignores it, so it doesn't replace it. If I double back quote it, then what I guess it does is it might have to actually that's weird I might have to like yeah that's hmm. does that make sense can you do that Okay, maybe that will work. I'm not sure. Um, so let me try doing a map car uh, eval around this. Yeah. It's not working for some reason. Eval has no... Did I do that wrong? I think I... I did that wrong. I think you, you're you supposed to just do it like that. Okay, it's saying that map card blah 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 right here is not a, a function name. Um, So it should be giving me a list back. So right here, right here I have the first part of the list. And then right here I have the second part. Something's not right, though, as far as... Because you have to do quasi-coding. Quasi-coding. Quasi-quoting. Hold on. I screwed something up right there. Okay. What? Okay, guys, I'm gonna try to figure it out. I'll be back. I'm gonna. So I got it. I figured it out. Uh, the one that I had before had too many parentheses, so I had actually had to get rid of some parentheses. And look, it works. So, um, yeah. It looks like the double, the nested quoting actually does work uh, as I really wanted it to in Lisp. And there you go. You can um, you can basically just run this command right here, 
and maps. So now we have 0 plus 0, 0 plus 1, 1 plus 0, and 1 plus 1. So I basically wanted to figure out how to just map all the possibilities with each other because then what we're going to do is we're going to replace these lists right here at the end with um, like continuations basically. So we're just going to keep appending to like this master list of um, expressions and yep yeah, I'll try to get that working really quick. Hey guys, um, so this is kind of weird. I try to replace the uh, quote zero one because there was two instances of it towards the end with X. Um, but the crazy thing is, is that I tried so many times and I couldn't get it to work. And I tried a comma and two commas. Um, apparently, I had to put this extra back quote right here, or not back quote, but apostrophe quote because whenever it replaces the x here with it apparently it takes away like the apostrophe or, or something um not sure why in fact i'm not even i'm not even sure yeah I don't even get why that has to be that way. That doesn't really make sense. But if I just put the the comma, it doesn't work. But then I have to put the quote. I am not, I don't know why. Huh, that's, that works too. Yeah, so. Yeah, not sure why it does that. Um, that is weird. It's like you need the the apostrophe here to treat it as data, but then somehow when it's put in, it's no longer data. But then you have to use the comma to say that you're assigning this x. But I guess it all works out because you can put, apparently you can put a of an apostrophe in front of that so I don't know hmm. but you don't need it there like that's what I don't get you know I had to put an apostrophe in front of it there you know if I add one see it doesn't work so why would I need to add one why would I need to add one on this inner X but not on the outer X you get what I'm saying so what's cool about this is I can just keep adding numbers though the fact that this works BAM see now suddenly I can add all the numbers from 0 and 3. Okay, add 4. Now it uh, adds all those. So keep going on this and I'll show you guys where it ends up. Guys, yeah, so this took this took me hours. Um this is crazy right here. So believe it or not, I went through all this trouble of trying to figure out why I couldn't get these these first numbers. It would list the numbers and it would it would it would add the sec the first pair, the first of the pair, but not the second. So I tried to take about the statements, but I had to actually uh, pull this number right here where I had to replace the X's with some numbers. Well, come to find out, all I have to do is surround uh, this, whatever the X usually is, with more parentheses and then add an apostrophe. But guess what? That doesn't work uh, when you just take the X um like this this x right here and you just add parentheses around it and then a, an apostrophe it that doesn't work so watch when i do when i when i tried that see up here no matter what i tried you know putting uh parentheses around the x or whatever um it said like you know quote has no value and things like that so uh 
it wouldn't work because the quasi quoting is kind of weird. It's kind of like macro, where it tries to apply it like before, but then not necessarily. I'm I'm not sure. It's kind of like a, I think it's kind of like a macro. Um, but whatever it was expanding and, and doing, it wasn't working when I treated the x exactly like the other expression. Um, but it just wasn't working. So I had to had to find a way around that. And, it, and eventually, I just tried a couple random things, and I got lucky because these two commas right here in front of the M, um, what I did was I tried putting, a, just inserting a little quote there. Um, and then I inserted one in front of the commas, I think, and then in between the commas. When I insert it in between the two commas, then it worked. So I'm like, this is ridiculous. You know, This is why people can't code in Lisp properly it's it's because of the fact that you have different levels of abstraction mixing together with a whole bunch of parentheses matching and that's like impossible for a human to do like an, a human can work with that very slowly but like up to a certain point and then after that like it just the complexity gets more and more in fact it might be exponential sorry that's my niece um getting ready to go to bed but there you go so i finally got it to work where it adds you know all the combinations and whew, i didn't even get multiplying done so that should be <sighs> so should that be episode one where we just combine you know to brute force through all possible lisp programs we just have addition um, and not only that, we're not even that good. We actually have something worse because we have a lot of overlap in semantics here. Because if I really wanted to do this well, we'd always order them somehow. We'd get like a hash of the first and the second expression, and then we'd always order them to see if we've already tried that one or not. Because why would you want to try two things twice, especially when the combinations increase like exponentially so because you know that addition is symmetric so it should always be ordered um and i think you can always order it i i assume you can always order it by the hash so if, if you see that you know there's so many combination combinations you want to do you don't have to do that many combinate combinations you don't have to do and you know squared combinations or whatever you can do uh i think it's a combination um function of them so if you have like three and two you only have to do well i guess you only have six but let's see if you had like three and three you wouldn't have to check all nine you'd only have to check um, probably three, uh, would it be three factorial? You'd only have to check six. Hold on, factorial would be bigger, wouldn't it? Mm, not factorial, but addition. Would it be factorial? Uh, anyway, my brain is like fried after just trying to figure this out. Um, Oh man, and I've been wanting to make, for years I've been wanting to make a Lisp editor that works all this out for you, um, and I wanted to make it at that one company, Runtime, but, you know, they thought that I was just there to do testing or something like that, so obviously they didn't understand that I've been wanting to work on this myself for so long, so in my opinion, that they're fools for thinking, oh, well, Tim's an idiot, and he can't code in Bash or whatever. Well, you know what? Screw you guys. <laughs> I'm going to do this anyway, so. Um, even if, even without the 10 PhDs and multi-million dollars that they have, I'll just do it on my own without them, so. Anyway, um, I think that'll be it for episode one. We'll try doing uh, episode two, three, and four, whatever, I guess, when I have the time. 
Um, but yeah, this is this is intense stuff. I wrote down a whole bunch of different functions here, so we can do let, cons, whatever. Try to use lists to our advantage. But the idea is that we'd make kind of generate uh, Lisp expressions, um, and then use the existing Lisp language to kind of. Uh, work through a couple. Of course, it's not very formally defined or whatever, um, but we can kind of make a subset language of our own, and then anything that doesn't work, we can just kind of skip over because we have to do timeouts anyway. So anything that doesn't work, you just kind of ignore. You just kind of put it off to the side. Um, treat it similar to like how you treat a timeout, and then. There you go, you can start combining functions and stuff like that, so. Um, yep. The idea is to be able to take a function that exists or program or something like that and then kind of automatically redesign it without writing your own proofs beforehand or anything like that, without writing your own uh, rules for rewriting. You just let the genetic algorithm try to figure out how to make your code better in some way, either faster, use less memory, or have a shorter code amount. So that's it. I will see you guys in episode two. Bye. Whoops. I mean episode one because I think I'm going to label this one as episode zero. So see you guys.